Recording in progress. So welcome everyone to Psalms for Life, uh, the weekly 30-minute uh, uh, class on Tehillim. And we'd like to thank uh, Esther Alagorovich for sponsoring these classes. May it be a source of blessing and success to her and her family. Okay. So we have a very exciting psalm this week. Um, it's it's uh, Parak Gimel, it's Psalm 3. And everything we've had so far, the two psalms so far that we have had, have been um, of general advice to each of us. And as we discussed before, Rebbe Nachman's advice is to find ourselves in the words of Tehillim. And those two previous psalms fairly easy to do because it's a general advice for humanity you know hang out with good people let good people um, everybody who signs in please on um, please mute please mute yourselves thank you okay um so hang around good people and don't hang around bad people and walk straight with Hashem and do good and you'll have a good life. It, it pretty simple, straightforward advice. Obviously it's deeper than that, but good advice. This Psalm takes a turn and it turns into a very deeply personal, upsetting and um, disturbing incident in David HaMelech's life, in King David's life. And this is the incident of Avshalom, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to, his son Avshalom, I'm going to give you some historical background, but I want to read the first verse. Mizmor David bevarcho mitne Avshalom b'no. So this is a song, a mizmor, okay, of David, of, of, King, of King David, when he fled from Avshalom, Avshalom, his son. Okay, so what was the historical context for this and what's the meaning of mizmor? So mizmor, as I've mentioned in the past, it's related to zemer, it means a song. And there are 10 types of songs in Psalms, 10 categories of songs. Some say there's 11. It depends whether you go by the Zohar, Zohar or not. And we're going to get to that later on when we hit Psalm 16. But here, it's odd. This is a song to, to David, or a song of David, however you want to phrase it. And it's a terrible situation that we're about to learn about. So uh, we have a, a, some interesting commentary here. When the term mizmor comes before David, a mizmor to David, uh, what we can take from that is that David wasn't naturally feeling like singing, like exulting, like being happy. And the song came first and lifted him up spiritually meaning that he himself had to work at lifting himself up. And when we hear the story about King David and his son, um, when we hear that story, we are going to be able to really to understand what I mean by that. So let's talk about David HaMelech. So we this isn't, again, this isn't perfectly chronological. The, the Psalms do jump around with biographical information and that's for spiritual reasons. But in general, we know that King David didn't have the easiest life. And in fact, this incident is one of the most disturbing. So David had uh, several sons from several wives and his, uh, his sons, were um, were uh, of some importance, four of them especially. Those were Amnon, Avshalom, Adonia, and Shlomo Hamela, who became king. And these four sons had very important roles to play in history. Um, please, if 
just signed in, please, uh, please mute yourself. Okay, thank you. I don't know why it's not automatically muting. It's supposed to be. I said it, but whatever. Okay, so in this situation, what we have here is Amnon. Amnon was David Sam by Ahinoam. And he was actually David's firstborn. And we know that the firstborn gets the inheritance, gets the legacy. We certainly are in the midst of the Parshas, which demonstrate that of Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. And his brother, Avshalom, was uh, the son of uh, a wife called Maka. And he was next in line. Okay, so if anything happened to Amnon, Avshalom would be king. Now, Avshalom was famous for something early on in his life that may seem trite, but it's significant in this story. He was famous for being very good looking and having beautiful long hair, okay? Luxurious hair. And we know that in Torah, a man is not supposed to have long hair, as a tr whether it's attractive or not. There are many spiritual reasons. There are many uh, modesty reasons and so on. So, and there's also the reasons of whether it will interfere with a man laying to fill in. So anyway, uh, um, he had a beautiful appearance and he was very proud of his hair. So he he uh, he predicted the 1960s and his hair was a source of great pride for him. And he had a sister called Tamar, different from the Tamar in the Chumash. And Tamar was incredibly beautiful also. This was a beautiful family, physically beautiful. Amnon, it's a, it's a very disturbing story. Amnon assaulted his half-sister, who was Avshalom's sister, Tamar, said that he raped her, which is, is mind-boggling from this holy family. And Avshalom became incredibly enraged, naturally so. And there was a tremendous feud. And I'm not going to go into all the details, but essentially, Avshalom uh, killed Amnon over this incident. Okay. And it's quite, um, it's quite um, a, a shocking incident when you think about it, because this is King David's family. Now, we know, we spoke before about the antecedents to David's spiritual level, but we also see that there was a mixed bag. This should give us all hope for anybody who has a child who, <laughs> who's struggling in a child who's good, you know, up to a certain extent, a parent's responsible and up to a, a certain extent, listen, you know, people are individuals and they make their own choices, certainly at the age Avshalom was, which was technically an adult. Okay, so Avshalom fled and hid with his mother's family for three years. And I want to add that he fled on a mule. And it is said that David HaMelech gave his sons and wives mules, not horses to ride on. He was very particular about the halacha that a king shouldn't, um, shouldn't be a show off with his horses and he shouldn't breed horses and he shouldn't make his stables his pride and joy. When we get to King Solomon, we'll talk about that later. But he took it very seriously. He was a very pious person. And he said, my family doesn't need big fancy horses. Mules are good enough for them. And these were very strong and fast mules. They weren't like ordinary mules, but they were still not horses with all that horses um, uh, convey. So rather than a, 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 a you know multiple car garage full of Porsches and, uh, and Lamborghinis, they had you know uh, a Vo uh, Volvos, okay? They were sturdy and useful. So anyway, um, Avshalom was finally able to return to Yerushalayim, but David couldn't see him because he killed his, his brother. He couldn't see him. But Yoav intervened and he was allowed to return to Yerushalayim. However, here's where we get just, just a heartrending situation. Avshalom now hated his father 
because he was banished from his father's sight. And he decided that, well, now I know my Abba isn't going to make me king next, even though I should be. So I'm going to force him to abdicate or take the throne away from him, from him. And I'm going to take the kingdom away from him. And David finally permitted Avshalom to appear before him because Avshalom manipulated the situation so much that his real motivations weren't showing. And he pretended to be contrite and filled with forgiveness, and he wasn't. So uh, David had received through prophecy that Shlomo, Solomon, was going to be king and not Avshalom. And that's where everything went haywire. Now, I'm not going to go into every detail, but needless to say, Avshalom planned a revolt, and he kept taking David's ministers and generals and this and that, getting them over to his side. He said, look, my father's 65 years old. Can you imagine this was right five years before David's death? He said, my father's 65 years old. And he's not going to last long anyway. You might as well side with me because I'm going to be king. So come on over to my side and let's overthrow my father. David got wind of this. He was threatened by all the troops that Avshalom had gathered to him. He had a few loyal retainers, some of whom actually went over to Avshalom's side, some who spied on Avshalom. Long story, you can read actually all the details in Shmuel, in Samuel, chapters, um, I think, 15 through 19. Okay, so if you're interested, pick up your Tanakh or Google. Uh, Rabbi Google could be helpful here. Anyway, there was such a heartache can you imagine having a son who did this? So uh, David did not want anything to happen to his son, but he knew he had to prevent him from overthrowing the kingdom because he knew Shlomo had to be king. And he knew Shlomo, he had prophecy, he knew Shlomo had to build the Beit HaMikdash. So there was a, a series of battles and chases. And again, you can read all the details. And in the end, the few troops that David had chased after Avshalom. Avshalom was fleeing. And as he was fleeing on his very fast mule, he was fleeing through a forest. And his hair, his beautiful hair, got caught in the branches of the tree and he got hung and killed and captured. That was it. He, was, he died. And this psalm is describing the inner pain that King David is feeling, the torment he is feeling because of this situation with what was once a beloved son. And it's, it's very, very moving. So it continues. Hashem marabut sarai rabim kamim alai. So um, Hashem, there's so many multiple tormentors I have, and they rise up against me. And rabim omarim lenafshi ein yeshuasa lo velokim salah. And many say to my soul, there is no salvation from him, from Hashem Salah. Okay. So everybody rose up against David. He had very few people that were openly on his side. And he is crying about this torment. But Rebbe Nachman in Lakute Maharan says something very amazing. He says that by using the word sarai, which is my tormentors, my pursuers, the people who are just out to get me, he's suggesting, David is suggesting that his sara, his sara or tsuras, as we say, his troubles and are very great. And because of this, 
somehow all these problems, the pursuers, the troubles, he's beginning to be free from his material existence and his sura, his inner form or his inner being is able to express itself. So we have those three sarais, sarai, sara, and sura, according to Rabbi Nachman. And because of this, he's able to write psalms, to compose psalms, to receive them prophetically that can help anyone else who is suffering. This is a key here. So because of his external suffering and his tormentors and his pursuers and his oh, terrible sources, his son, a son slays another son, and then he wants to kill the father. I mean, oh, awful. Because of this, David can express himself spiritually in a way that anyone who's having suffering can relate to and benefit from the words of this psalm and all the psalms. Okay, this was an unleashing and unlocking of the tzura, this inner form, this inner soul that was able to receive the prophecy of Tehillim. So when was this composed in the other psalms? I don't know. We're not sure. But again, we're not going to be worried about the chronology of Sefer Tehillim of the Book of Psalms in order. We're just going to be focused on each Psalm as it relates to the others and as it relates to itself and as it relates to us. So we really have this inc incredible story here. And this is, um, this ability to relate is because uh, Chazal tell us um, actually, it's in Talmud, that um, a rebellious child in the home is worse than the war of Gog and Magog. So how can we understand this from the perspective of, uh, let's say we have, okay, let's say we have um, uh, all good children, Okay, please God, they're not rebels. Okay, no child's perfect and they're gonna go through their teens and whatever, but they're not rebels. How can we relate to this? So again, we look for ourselves in this Psalm. And the deeper meaning of this Psalm is, is who are our pursuers? Who are our tormentors? Very surface level, level of reading this is to read it at the level that, hey, there's court cases, there's family arguments, we may be pursued in general. So this kind of pursuing and this kind of torment, um, certainly we can pull from it here. But what we're really pulling from it is this idea that Hashem is our salvation, no matter what anyone else says. And even King David knew this and discussed it so that we can tap into this, the power of this psalm. Because it says, okay, oh, and I want to go back to the word salah. I'll remind, I'll remind myself of that in a minute. Va'ata Hashem ma'gen ba'adi kivodi me'rim roshi. But you, Hashem, you're a shield for me. Hashem is a magen, okay? A shield. You're a shield for me. And you are my kavod, my glory and honor, and the one who raises my head high. If I'm, if I'm going to be raised up, it's from Hashem. So I'm going to rely on Hashem. We can't raise ourselves up on our own. This is not the, the Jewish mindset. The Jewish mindset is, is we try, but ultimately the outcome is up to Hashem. Hashem has to raise us up if Hashem wants us to raise up. It means that we make the steps to be raised up, but we rely on Hashem to protect us and to shield us from all our tormentors, whoever they may be. And we're going to discuss more about that in a minute. Um, so I want to briefly touch on this word Salah, which we find in, only really in Psalms. We find it in, um, uh, in Tanakh, in Habakkuk as well a few times. This word Salah is hotly debated. What does it mean? So some commentaries say it means uh, forever. Um, and so when we say Salah, we're saying this idea exists internally. Okay, so the first idea was um, there's no, um, many say there's no salvation for him for, from Hashem, Salah. That's what people say, okay, forever. 
Salah also, some commentary says that it's a musical notation because remember Psalms always, they were composed with music, okay? They have music to them. We may not know the music to them, but they have music. And when Mashiach comes, we'll hear the music to them, okay? The, the melodies, okay? And we know there were 72 part harmonies uh, uh, when the Leviim sang in the Beit HaMikdash. So hopefully we'll hear them with those beautiful harmonies. Okay, 72 parts, can you imagine? So also Salah um, is maybe a notation that we're supposed to actually repeat this verse as a chorus as when, when it's sung. So there are a few and different interpretations of what it actually means. Okay, I wanted you to know that because we're going to be walking into a lot of cellas as we go forward in Psalms. We see that word and it doesn't even have a translation. If you have translation, it just says, spells it out in English. Okay, so anyway, um, Hashem is the one who, um, who, uh, saves us. He's our shield. He lifts us up. And the psalm goes on in a few more lines. What's the time? Okay. That, that's where we get protected, is from Hashem. So who are our tormentors? And how can Hashem help us from them? So Hashem could do anything. However, we have a kind of tormentor, which is the kind of tormentor that Rebbe Nachman encourages us to find in the psalm. Everything in the psalm, we can find an inner meaning. So the tormentor is, what is the tormentor? So the tormentor can be the Yetzir Hara, who's going to torment you. How does the Yetzir Hara torment us? It doesn't just lead us into transgression. The Yetzir Hara torments us very specifically in a way that Rebbe Nachman makes a profound statement. After a person does something wrong, he beats himself up and he becomes depressed. He falls into a depression. That is the Yetzer Hara's signature torment. Okay. We all know we've all we've all done things we're not proud of. Sometimes by accident, sometimes because we're a little dense and we don't want to really look at ourselves, and sometimes on purpose. We're human, okay? We're not angels. What comes afterwards, the torment that comes afterwards, okay, that is the, that is the secret weapon of the Yetzir Hara. And now that you know about it, it's not secret anymore. Rebbe Nachman says that the Yed Sahara loves to win by making you depressed. Okay. So if you're depressed about the negative things in your life, what does that mean? How does that torment you? You can never deal with them. You cannot deal with them if you're depressed about them. Because one of two things will happen. Either they will pursue you, just like in the Psalm, they'll, they'll, they're going to rise up against you and chase after you in such a way that you're going to flee from even thinking about it or dealing with the issue. Okay. And in my experience, coaching women, this is the, one of the primary things that occurs at least early on in, in, in active spiritual growth is that the person will externalize all the torment and this, their part in the situation, whatever that may be, they can't face that there's some responsibility or some, some, um, some liability. And so they have to externalize it or bury their heads in the sand because it's painful. It's painful to look in the mirror and see the flaws. Okay. The other thing that can happen is that the person does look at the flaws so much so. It's another thing. Women do this a lot. People do this a lot. They beat themselves up terribly to the point where they're depressed. It depends whether you have a more developed id or a more developed superego, not to, not to give too much weight to those terms, but whether you're more about you know, externalizing and self-protection or whether you're more about feeling down on yourself. These are the two kinds of torments.
Okay. This is the psycho spiritual battle that takes place inside everyone, according to Rebbe Nachman. Now, I'm describing it in my own words, and I'm taking from a lot of his teachings, but this is the battle, okay? Are we going to evade and ignore and never accomplish spiritually, or are we going to be so weighed down that we suffocate under the weight of our own pain and our own guilt and shame? Shame especially is a big one. So Rebbe Nachman says, David HaMelech understands, King David understands, and he's telling us, if we look carefully, everybody's saying, the Yetzir Hara is saying there's no salvation for your soul, okay, even from Hashem, Selah, right, again and again forever, but no, Hashem is a shield for me, he is he is my glory, my kavod, he's my honor. He's going to lift me up and he's going to raise my head high. And all I have to do is take that step. Okay. So take that step in the right direction. What is the step? The step is, is twofold. First, to focus on your strengths to make sure you feel strong enough to deal with whatever you have to deal with, whether the torment is internal, for most of us, it's often internal, or whether it is external, okay? Take the step to look at your good points. If you're dealing with other people, look at their good points, okay? Can't say that more, more, more than enough. We, we like to polarize. They're all, they did one thing bad, they're, they're all bad. They're, they're no good. Okay, they did one thing good, they're angels. That's a good person, that's a bad person. We can't do that, okay? Because we're going to end up looking in the mirror and our heads are going to explode. Gosh, Michelle, but, you know, we're a mixed bag. Everybody is. So what we have to do, take this opportunity to say, Hashem, I'm going to look at the good in me. I'm going to follow the advice of the Tzadik Emes, of the Treat Tzadik. I'm going to look at the good in me. I'm going to move towards solving the issue. Maybe it's tshuva. Maybe it's making reparations. Maybe it's, ton, it's always tons of prayer. And when I feel a little bit strong enough to cope, you know, I'm going to then deal with what breaks me. The shame, the toxic shame, the pain, the guilt. You have to do, I'm saying steps as if it's step one and step two. It doesn't always look like that. It could be simultaneously. Sometimes the break, the brokenness comes before the finding the Nikuda Tova, the good point. Sometimes the brokenness has to happen first. It, sometimes people are so, you know, have such a wall that they have to actually feel the pain in order to be moved to see the good. Okay. So King David tells us what to do next. And that is, is to call aloud to Hashem because then Hashem will answer us, okay? We have to call aloud. And that calling aloud, that voice, oh, I wish we had a, 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 something else I could do here, but that voice that we call aloud with, that's, that voice from a Breslov perspective is tefillah, and specifically, heat bodedut. Okay, talking to Hashem about whatever is in your head, on your mind, and in your heart, and getting it out and working it through. And sometimes other people can be good sounding boards, but they are not a replacement for talking to Hashem. They can be an adjunct, they can help you, but still we have to talk to Hashem. And that's what all the Psalms are, okay? Because then uh, uh, David goes on to say, um, Kuma Hashem Hoshienu, uh, Hoshieni Elokai Ki Hikisa Es Kol Oivai Lechi Shanei Rashaim Shibarta. Okay, so um, um, Kuma Hashem, rise up Hashem, 
Okay, uh, Hoshiani, save me, Elokai, my Lord, because you've struck all my enemies on the cheek and you've broken the teeth of the, the, the wicked ones. And salvation belongs to Hashem. So David's telling us his problems. He's telling us he was pursued. He had his own inner demons too. Okay, not just external. And where does the salvation come from? From when he cried out to Hashem. He knew first he recognized Hashem was the one to turn to. And he asked Hashem for help, cried out to him. And then he was very specific and say that salvation belongs to Hashem. Okay. Salvation belongs to Hashem. That's the way it is. So what we have to remember is that is to find ourselves in the Psalms. And that's why, you know, saying Psalms, I, I want to really um, suggest this to you. I may have already done this, but I think it's important. That's why when we say Psalms, you know, it's, it is good to say them in the Hebrew, in the Lashem Kodesh, because that has, um, it has a special power, especially with Tehillim, okay, it has a special power. Yet at the same time, it's important to understand what you're saying. It really is. So if I haven't already said this, okay, but if I have already, you'll forgive me. My suggestion is, is it's Psalms, even for people who are fluent in Hebrew, it's difficult language. Read it first in English and then say it in Hebrew with the English in mind or read it with the interlinear translation with the English underneath. Okay, that's it for Psalm 3. And what we're going to do now is I want to, um, we're going to all read together. I was told to slow down by a few people. So we're going to read slowly, silently together. We're going to start with Psalm 3, which is for... Um, Psalm 3 is for a, um, it says it's for shoulder pain and a headache. It's Segula for those. And we are up to uh, day six, which begins with Psalm 35, which we're going to say after we say Psalm 3. And that's a Segula. I'm going to uh, tell you what the Segulas are, um, what these Psalms are said for. If you want the Segulas, Psalm 35 is um it's psalm 35 through 38 we're going to say that afterwards so psalm 3 then psalm 35 through 38 and psalm 35 is a segula for a favorable judgment and protection against enemies okay and again that can mean internal enemies and it can mean a literal court judgment and of course it can always mean it always means a judgment in heaven because any judgment down below is certainly happening up above. Psalm 36 is a protection from, um, from evil, from wickedness, from wicked people, wicked things, wicked events. Psalm 37 is a psalm. Uh, it's a very interesting one. It's a segula for, and, and read it slowly and read the words because they're relevant to the segula. A psalm that helps us maintain our principles. And it's it cautions us to... Uh, the the Segula cautions us not to envy or be jealous of evil people in this world, because evil people in this world often are very successful, not always, but often, and we cannot envy them because we trust in Hashem and we know that there is going to be a fair judgment. And then Psalm 38 is for finding your soulmate, okay? for help for difficult times and for protection from Lash and Hara. So we got a lot of Sabulas today. So I'm going to turn off the recording, which I actually should have done. <laughs>